ladies and gentlemen. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome uh, to this lecture. Uh, my name is Adrian Collette, for those of you I haven't met, uh, and I'm Vice Principal Engagement here at the University of Melbourne. And in extending a very warm welcome to you, I want to acknowledge that we gather on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past <coughs> and present and all Aboriginal people who continue in this place to inform the way we live. So welcome to the seventh annual University Librarians Lecture. Uh, today's lecture also is very special because I believe it's the inaugural uh, lecture or it is a lecture as part of the inaugural research at Library Week and congratulations to Donna and Jennifer and many, many <coughs> others who have been organising and leading this terrific initiative. I hope it's gone well. I hear that it has. I hear you program too much, which is the way of the university. We always program too much. Um, of course, I know that Philip is going to talk about research today and is absolutely vital to the university's interests as well as teaching and learning and the life of students. And I think nothing better exemplifies the collaboration between the very finest professional staff and the academic ambitions of this university than the library, its collections, uh, in the way it builds an evidence base and serves the interests of our research. And I've heard it talked about in many dispatches as if we could find that sort of collaboration across the university between scholarship, research and professional contribution we'd be an even greater university than we currently are. So thank you very much indeed uh, for all your efforts. I know that many people here are involved with that. So today's lecture, of course, is delivered by Philip Kent. Uh, following an extensive career at the CSIRO, Philip joined Melbourne at a very important and critical time. Following the Information Futures Commission and the development of a 10-year information strategy for the university, <coughs> the library has been reinvigorated under his leadership. Its history as a repository of vital research and cultural collections remains central to the role of the library and of course the university. And now also as executive director collections, Philip is responsible for the strategic leadership for the significant cultural collections that distinguish Melbourne within the sector and help define the character of the university itself. Beyond the university, Philip serves us extremely well in the broader community. It's actually an act of tremendous leadership. He's a director of Caval Limited, chair of the group of eight librarians, chair of the Council of Australian University Librarians, Electronic Resources Consortium, and chair of the editorial board of the Australian Library Journal, and a member of Cornell University's Archive Members Advisory Board. That is quite a portfolio to be carrying, and I congratulate you on it, Phil. In his lecture, Partnering Research, Opportunities and Challenges, Philip will now discuss the opportunities and challenges for libraries in building partnerships with researchers and research communities. And I believe you might even make reference to the new engagement strategy along the way. That's a plug. Um, Philip's lecture, importantly, will be followed by afternoon tea in the Japanese garden, the beautiful Japanese garden on the fourth floor uh, of the Melbourne School of Design. Welcome, Philip Kent. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adrian. It's a pleasure to have you introduce me today. And also, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, here we go. It seems bizarre that it's now number seven of my annual lectures. I haven't been here for a whole seven years, but this is the seventh lecture. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is to cover um, a, a few things up front that are perhaps more about the strategy of the university because there's a lot of people in the audience who I think perhaps wouldn't have heard uh, some of this context first. Um, but then I want to go and talk about some, um, some projects that I've been personally involved in um, recently uh, and in, and in uh, the last section in particular some uh, examples that I've picked up around the place that I think are really good evidence of good practice that's help, uh, happening in other places uh, but is also, um, also happening here in different ways and in, in some cases the same ways. 
So the university has um, produced uh, earlier this year uh, our new Growing Esteem strategy, which builds on the previous one and takes us from now through to 2020. And as we have in the past, we have reaffirmed our desire to being one of the finest universities in the world. And to do that, we're continuing to work with the teaching and learning, research and engagement strands of the triple helix. Um, but, and, and a lot of the other things that have been part of our strategy to date will continue forward. And so, in fact, the sorts of things that appear in the document are actually things that we're sort of particularly putting the spotlight on. It doesn't mean that we're stopping doing some other things that have been you know, our guiding part of our strategy, but in particular what's been picked out um, have been some of the things that might change and transform us as we move forward um, as an organisation. And obviously a lot of these things will uh, impact on libraries and collections um, across the university. Um, and, and also the fact that we intend to, to grow our, our student numbers in some areas as well. Uh, in particularly focusing on research, because that is what I've been asked to, contact, uh, to focus on this year because it's part of the Researcher in Library Week, um, is the uh, areas of, of where we might focus our research. Again, this doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to close down some areas of research, but what we're going to do is, is target and invest in some areas where we think that we can get particular outcomes. Uh, the precincts have been um, a growing thing for the university and will continue to be that. And I think this is really important for us, as you'll see, in terms of engagement, because precincts are actually about place. And places thrive because of people. And so I, I particularly like this focus here. Um, and uh, there's also things in, in the, uh, the strategy also about the workforce because, again, we can't deliver um, unless we've got ex an excellent re uh, research workforce. And again, I think that's how the library can work to support that workforce and help them, particularly as, uh, you know, a lot of the activities that the library is doing in this space is around training and maximising their um, ability to understand all these other things like publishing, um, the conversation and um, altmetrics and those sorts of things. Uh, and within the, the growing esteem strategy um, is also, and it's really been, uh, I guess, affirmed uh, as a university, we've looked and uh, we started out uh, when I first came uh, with that iteration of Growing Esteem where we called it knowledge transfer and uh, that, that language didn't sort of really work in some ways and that's why we've changed uh, the language in recent, more recent times to engagement which I think uh, resonates much better uh, with, with people. And so I just want to focus a little bit about the on the engagement at Melbourne strategy, which we'll be releasing and uh, making widely available shortly. Um, but uh, as, as with the growing esteem strategy, our, our, um, our target, I suppose, will be to really look at things through this lens of uh, engagement. And, and we'll do this by these um, constituent parts. And this first commitment is called public value. And again, lots of universities around the world are doing this. Some people call it social justice. Some people call it, I um, uh, can't think of, of, of uh, the, the other terms, but it, it's all about um, demonstrating val uh, value and worth uh, to the community. And we're certainly seeing this happening, particularly in the UK and with their trends towards impact in measuring uh, research outcomes. Here in this country, we don't measure impact. That's not required. The ERA doesn't include that. Um, but that hasn't been, um, hasn't been put aside for the future. It, and in fact, I spoke to Aidan Byrne about this not long ago, and he sees it as perhaps a, another activity that might sit alongside uh, what we do in counting publications. 
uh, but impact is certainly we've been tracking what's happening in the UK and we can certainly see all these questions about you know the big investment that are going that is going into universities and uh, whether that uh, whether it's demonstrating value for the community at large. And again, the engagement strategy realises that we cannot deliver, um, engagement shouldn't be just something that's on the side, it has to be, as we've used these terms, engaged research, engaged students, and uh, engaged research, of course. And uh, this is putting a different focus on things, and this is why on that earlier slide I also said that this also has big implications for our research workforce because we're effectively going to expect them to be engaged as well as pumping out uh, research, and therefore um, that also uh, needs to be recognised in terms of uh, rewards and uh, workload and, and those sorts of things. And just as uh, in the library's strategy, the information strategy of the university, we, we have enablers there. Similarly, in the engagement strategy, we, will, we have um, some enablers there where things like uh, systems, uh, the new brand campaign, how we work with um, alumni, how we work with fundraising are all really important to help us achieve um, the engagement strategy. So that was the end of the, um, I suppose, commercial, but I took the, the opportunity of you all being here to just give you a quick snapshot of the strategic framework that we're sitting in um, in the university at the moment, particularly as uh, a lot of that is um, very off the, uh, fresh off the, the presses. Um, I want to talk briefly now about a survey that I was uh, very involved with and uh, Melbourne led this project. Uh, it happened late uh, in 2014 and earlier this year. Uh, five members of the group of eight participated. We worked with a, um, a company uh, which is called Ithaca uh, SNR, which is based in New York and they produce a similar survey where they uh, survey academics right across the US. That's where it started. And more recently, it's been run across um, the UK through Research Libraries UK and the GISC. Um, it's a, we were a bit of a guinea pig in that it was run uh, previously in those other two regions as a whole of country thing. Here we ran it in those five institutions, but then we were able to aggregate the data together to get an Australian um, perspective on research from, uh, from academics, and then to be able to benchmark that against um, other institutions. There is also um, some data which we don't have access yet to yet uh, from a similar project in Canada and also Hong Kong. And I'm particularly interested in that because Hong Kong University and this university have a long tradition. Uh, we've also had uh, members of our academic staff here who have gone on to be vice chancellor at Hong Kong, etc. So that's the, the context of the survey that we ran. And again, there's a lot more information on this and I can give whole um, presentations, but I just want to pick out a few things for you today because I think they're particularly relevant to the topic today on researchers and that sort of intersection between researchers and libraries. This question was about sources of scholarly materials that, that researchers use uh, by the different disciplines and the, the, um, the bottom of the, the slide you can see the different disciplines uh, represented. Um, while it's not surprising that the scholarly monograph continues to figure highly for humanities, I thought it was particularly interesting that if you look at um, the top uh, box in particular, um, that peer-reviewed journals score highly for all disciplines, including humanities. And then from this next question, um, these data show us that um, we can see a desire to more deeply integrate digital research methods into academic work, but academics are telling us here that shortage of time and technical skills um, to be able to do this and indulge in more digital research um, 
uh, is not always there for them. And again, it varies across disciplines, but it's something that, that um, faculty members are telling us they, they need help with. And I think this is a place where obviously libraries can help. With this uh, question, we start to see comparisons um, between Australia, which is the grey at the top, um, and our US, which is the orange in the middle, and the UK researchers, which is the dark blue. I'm particularly interested in the third bar from the top, where you can see that Australia leads in helping researchers assess the impact of their work following publication. And also on the bottom bar, you can see that in making uh, research outputs freely available online in addition to the published version. In terms of making final or preprints openly available, we can see through the second and third bars that Australia is ahead of the US and the UK on institutional repositories and discipline repositories. And we can see from this slide that the library, along with IT departments and other repositories, are seen to be valuable in helping researchers manage and preserve their research data. And finally, we see here that group of eight researchers are more dependent on the university library for their research than the UK and the US. So in summary, my findings from a quite extensive work that's here that I haven't shown you all the data for uh, in this presentation. Um, in terms of disciplines, because all the data that we have uh, can be sorted and, and uh, sliced and diced according to the different disciplines. There's no real surprises there, but one of the other things that pleased me was that we did get high responses from Melbourne um, in the medical health and biological sciences, which is, is really helpful to have. And while there's the comparisons, and we can do that and say, you know, Melbourne scored better than UNSW on this one, or um, Sydney scored better than UWA on another, I think what's more interesting for us is comparing Australian researchers and, and their perceptions of libraries with uh, the US and the UK. Um, Australia tends to score um, higher on those research partnership questions than the UK and the US, and I've shown you some of those, but particularly around research impact and repositories. And um, we're certainly on open access output stronger than the US, but just slightly behind the UK. And then in terms of research data management, which has been a new business line for the library here over the last uh, seven years or so, um, and this was a new module for the survey, um, but certainly it, it affirms the importance uh, of data to researchers. Half of the respondents indicated also that data gathered by other researchers is very important, so that, that ties in with some of our aspirations there, and that um, academics preserve their own data by and large, but there are also some indications that they appreciate and value the institutional and library roles. I now want to give you a little bit of feedback on some other research that I've given. And again, I've, um, I've got much longer presentations on this and um, plan to share some of that deeper data, particularly with the staff in the library. But um, this is, uh, you, you may recall, we were the first um, university in the Southern Hemisphere to buy the Springer Book Archive, 110,000 books going right back to 1842. Uh, this included people like Einstein's books, all been digitised and now all available to our um, customers. We had of those, um, initially it was 100,000, now 110,000. We had about 33 of those books already, but we gained the digital versions of those through this purchase, but uh, also importantly, we gained those other um, you know, 77,000 um, books to basically catch up on books that we may not have had before. And we can see here, this is it's still early days because we only have one full year of the data. 
and you, you don't have to go into all the detail, but certainly the ones that are in colours, and it probably doesn't matter which colour is which, but it just tells us that particularly those disciplines are the ones that um, scored more highly in our usage of this large uh, book collection. And uh, the other thing that's interesting, you can see in the numbers right down the bottom, the value of those downloads if we had to buy them. So it, to me, it's telling us that we've, been, um, that we've made a, a good and judicious purchase and that we're getting value for money. And particularly what I've found is that, that this is sort of a bit different from journals in that we're really seeing very different usage and practice over different years uh, changing around. Um, one of the other interesting uh, areas that's come out of the research has been that the back file, that is the archive that we bought, um, is being used about 30% and uh, the contemporary file, or what uh, is also known as the front file, is being used, um, and so these are the books from uh, 2005 onwards. Uh, and the um, people at um, Springer in Europe, uh, when I was there giving a presentation on uh, this information recently, was telling, were telling me that this was consistent with averages worldwide. And uh, I then also looked at what was not being used versus what was being used. And uh, we can see there that it was moving around from year to year. And again, I think this is one area where we'll need to get more data. So in summary about our actual usage of this collection, and remember these are very you know, high level research uh, type of publications, um, that we're using about 30% of the historic archive and about 70% of the uh, usage is coming from the current. Our top five disciplines, not surprising given the profile of the university, but again, this changes uh, year by year. Um, approximately uh, 21,000 titles uh, have been downloaded per annum and uh, 25 downloads per title have also been downloaded. And as I said, the not used um, titles varies, but even though we are not using some of the titles, we're also seeing that those that we're using are high value and so we're getting our money's worth. This um, gives us that data, but it also gives us the analysis by the copyright range um, across the years. And you can see here um, more detail about um, what's being used. Um, and you can see in particular the majority of usage is for titles published in that post-World War II era um, of 1955 onwards. Um, but this is perhaps not a surprise because that's also the period when publishing uh, and scholarship boomed uh, after the Second World War and when universities grew massively also. But also if you look at that bottom chart, you can see that the average number of downloads per used title provides a more uh, even distribution. So although the, there's a lot heavier usage of titles from the current period, there were also, there's also a lot more titles to be potentially used in the current period. And in fact, although I was really interested in the old books, I suppose, to see what was happening with them, um, it, it, there's, there's not as many there to be used anyway. I particularly was interested to see um, which were our most heavily used titles um, during this um, three years that we've had um, the, the collection available. In particular, and these are really big numbers, the uh, surgery was used over 9,800 times and probability was used over 6,600 times. And then those next three titles were used between two or 3,000 times per title. They cover the disciplines of medicine and biomedical and life sciences, as well as maths and stats and engineering. I was eager to understand why these particular titles were used. Uh, all of them come from the period between 1981 and 2001. Surgery was also held in print in our biomedical library and is classified by Springer as a reference work. 
probability is more on the textbook side, but it's at that high end of textbooks, um, particularly for graduate level students, um, people looking at the mathematical theory of probability. Um, the radiation regime and architecture of plant stands is also held in our biomedical library, and this is actually a contributed volume uh, in the biomedical and life sciences category. And the surgery of the stellar region covers, quote, a challenging and interdisciplinary subject dealing with the base of the skull. So this is really sort of deep... Um, area of research, and yet it's being used, one of our most heavily used titles. And computational me mechanics uh, is, um, uh, is the proceedings of an international engineering conference. I also then wanted to look at the books that were as old as our first purpose-built library here at the university, and that's about 100 um, titles were used between 1888 and 1949. Only five books um, in that pre-1900 period were used 56 times. And the big surprise for me, knowing that this is a really a heavily science and medicine uh, collection of books, the oldest books used come from humanities, social sciences and law. The oldest non-humanities book used is Perfumes, Cosmetics and Soaps from 1914 and a Maths and Stats book from the same year. The oldest biomedical book used is The Genetics of the Pig from 1916 and a Handbook of General Pharmacology from 1918. Sadly, my dream of University of Melbourne academics and students reading early editions of Einstein, Diesel and Benz has not been realised. Two heavily used early humanities titles stand out and require further investigation. Although there are 100 um, oldest titles um, in that pre-1950, many of them are actually monographs in series. Uh, or, or annual types of publications. And so if you look at uh, not just individuals, but if you, you aggregate them together into the series, one that really stands out is uh, the 10 volumes that were used of the development of the Italian schools of painting. And uh, they range from 1891 to 1930, and they were used 168 times, making it the most used pre-1950 series. They include chapters of the various regions of Italy, and they document the art in churches and other institutions through commentary and many rich black and white photographs. Professor Janie Anderson tells me that she would imagine that most of this usage would come from researchers. She says, this is one of the few detailed surveys in English as distinct from recent overviews that would allow you to make statistical surveys of regions or a period or would allow you to find material that is not on Wikipedia and to find um, authoritative accounts of uh, minor buildings and paintings. And similarly, the variant title of original drawings of Rembrandt is actually the oldest Springer Book archive used, uh, and the 1888 volume has been used once. But in fact, we've used five volumes from 1888 to 1925, uh, 155 times. And the reason why is that the original drawings of Rembrandt are reproduced at a very high quality. And um, this one is perhaps more related to teaching than research, although I think it's uh, certainly at the postgraduate level that uh, Janie uh, drew my attention to a course called Baroque Art in Polycentric Europe, where they spend a whole week on a research project on Rembrandt. So we're sort of thinking this might be uh, the reason behind this heavy usage. So in conclusion, looking at the Springer Book Archive, we can see that the heaviest usage is coming from those disciplines that we're good in at this university, that seven, 30 to 70 re, uh, relationship between the, uh, the old and the, the new books from Springer. Um, the titles heavily used change between years. 
and um, there's uh, only five that were heavily used um, more greater than 2,000 times per year and only 10 titles used between 1 and 2,000 times a year. And as I said, the majority of work, uh, the majority of usage is post-World War II. I think it, um, I'm looking forward to us getting more information and data as we've had this, um, particularly after the end of this year, when then we'll have two full years as well as one part year data to analyse, but I think we can certainly do a much more sophisticated analysis of it, uh, but also I think it'll give us an opportunity to look at the print versions versus the online version and see what's happening in the, the book space. And also we can um, start to think about which books uh, we have in uh, online that can perhaps go to store. I want to now change track again, and I want to tell you about um, two research institutes at the University of Birmingham. You may be aware that through the University of 21, we have a very strong relationship with Birmingham. And as a result of a recent delegation led by the provost, they expressed a desire to work more closely with us, particularly in the area of cultural collections. Some of you will be aware that we have a very successful annual uh, scholarship program for more than five years now, I think, whereby one of their curatorial students comes here and conversely, one of our star students has the opportunity to have an immersive experience at the collections at Birmingham. I received a very warm welcome uh, in the last few weeks uh, when I was on my way to some other commitments. In particular, they were eager for me to visit two of their world famous research institutes where research and engagement are inti intimately entwined. The Iron Bridge Institute occupies a World Heritage listed site of about 5.5 square kilometres, uh, situated about 50 kilometres from Birmingham. It's the home of the world's first iron bridge, which you can see on, front of the, on the screen erected in 1779 from iron smelted at the world's first blast furnace, which was created in 1709 at Colebrookdale. As Professor Mike Robinson, the Institute Director and Professor of Cultural Heritage said, this was the home of the cultural revolution, oh, sorry, the industrial revolution. That was a bit of a slip, wasn't it? Um, this was the home of the Industrial Revolution, but also really the home of global warming. This amazing site is home to 10 museums and cultural collections. It is at the very intersection between research, engagement, cultural heritage, tourism, and collections. The whole site has really been rejuvenated by these various roles and opportunities. And I was particularly um, pleased that Mike took me to visit um, one, one site where there was a famous tile manufacturer uh, who had been there right from the earliest days uh, when it was almost a, an industrial wasteland who moved out quite a long time ago, but because of the rejuvenation of the site has actually moved back to where their company roots were. And I was surprised to learn that and saw all of this because it's all the museum incorporates um, all of the history there from this company, that that was the place you visited if you were doing a major building project and you didn't have the internet to look at designs and things, you would go there and visit and you would choose your tiles and they had a whole lot of installations that you could see all of those tiles um, displayed in all their glory and that's where you selected and ordered them for your major projects. And what, what was really fascinating is that all the original moulds are still there and they have the moulds that produce the original tiles for the Houses of Parliament in Westminster and those tiles and those moulds are being pressed back into service because they're doing a major renovation at the Houses of Parliament. And so they're able to reproduce through these um, heritage moulds um, to, to use them again. And what's also been really interesting about this whole site has been in the same way that that company moved back there, there are a whole lot of other companies that are moving there, a lot of small um, consultants and other groups that are moving there, artisans, 
and, uh, and other um, manufacturers and completely different businesses have um, sort of been re-established in that neighbourhood because of the large um, tourism value that comes from being there. Quite a different type of uh, institute, but equally interesting for us here at the University of Melbourne, is at Stratford-upon-Avon, which is only an hour away from Birmingham, and it's the Shakespeare Institute, which is also part of the university. It was established in the 1950s, actually at the Birmingham campus, but was physically relocated to Shakespeare's hometown, where it is the centre for very deep scholarship. And I was pleased to meet their deputy director, um, who in particular collaborates with our own Shakespeare expert, um, David McInnes, here at Melbourne. Um, the institute works closely with their neighbours, the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. It has its own purpose-built world-class research library run by, as they call it on their website, a priceless team of expert librarians. The library was actually built through the support and leadership of Dame Judi Dench. And uh, also Ken Branner is very actively involved in the life and work. He is a fellow uh, of the Institute. Uh, the library includes amazing archives, not just around the scholarship of Shakespeare, but things like rare marked up scripts that they showed me from famous Shakespearean actors who have given their own interpretation and recorded that. Um, so that this is really contributing um, not just to uh, textual scholarship, although we all know about David's amazing work and his Lost Plays database, but also um, lots of aspects around performance. Um, and of course, these, this also provides um, the raw materials for lots of other disciplines, not just uh, uh, drama and literature. There's lots of things like music and other aspects of Shakespearean England. And of course, they do all the major things in particular next year being the 400th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare. Uh, they'll be holding two major conferences. Um, they do a, a, the world's biggest postgraduate conference in Shakespearean studies. Uh, and then this relationship between them and the Royal Shakespeare um, is also really interesting. And we're hoping that we might be able to work with them next year here at Melbourne as well because of the, uh, our intention to uh, work with the faculties uh, to celebrate uh, Shakespeare's the 400th anniversary here in Melbourne as well. I just wanted to say a couple of things about open access because I know that we've had a focus this week on open access through a number of sessions, so I don't want to revisit any of that. But I guess some of my thinking has been, uh, I guess, swayed because of some of the things I've been doing in, in recent times. In my role as uh, convening that consortium that's negotiating around a lot of the deals that we're doing, we um, have been negotiating with some of the biggest publishers worldwide. And I also had the opportunity um, while I was in Frankfurt at the book fair uh, to proceed with some of those negotiations um, with, with one of the major vendors. Uh, but we've seen a change because here in Australia, we've, we've very much followed the green open access path, that is to put copies into institutional repositories. Uh, whereas in the UK, because of policy there and in Europe, uh, a lot of the world is now going more towards gold open access. And there, there's a flow on effect from that now that in, the, in uh, Europe and the UK, they're now flipping their purchasing models and they're actually moving away from the traditional library type of subscription and moving to uh, basically where you purchase uh, gold open access credits um, for about the same amount of money that you've been spending on library subscriptions over the years. We've, in Australia, because we've tended to have a, a green focus, we've tended to, um, to say no, we don't want those sort of models. But, but what became really clear to me in talking with a number of senior colleagues uh, uh, around the world recently is that we're, we're part of a global economy and what will happen is that there will be pricing models that will rule out uh, worldwide and that they won't be wanting to do different things to different models or different markets. 
So it's sort of a bit chilling to me to sort of have that realisation that because we're such a small part of the world, our chances of influencing um, some of these models, even though you know Australia has fairly firmly been in the, the green open access camp. So that's just a, a little observation of mine, but the, another big surprise for me was that um, part of this following is also uh, getting strong feet in China as well. And when you think about what a big economy they are as well, when you combine you know, China, Europe, the UK, um, it, it means that um, the, the world as we know it in terms of scholarly publishing uh, can, will probably change. I now just want to finish off with a section on um, the librarians as research partners. And this is really just a little bit of a, um, a, a few case studies or, or just to draw your attention to some, some things that have been sort of front of mind or, or I've interacted with just in, in particularly the last uh, couple of months. Um, I'm, as Adrian said, I'm a member of the board of X Archive, which is really probably one of the first um, open access initiatives in the world, uh, bringing together all the um, publications, the, the preprints, et cetera. And it's actually become totally embedded in the work of um, particularly not just uh, physicists, but also computer scientists and financial management uh, data people. Um, and uh, it's become, I know computer scientists, the first thing they do every day, they start by looking at X archive to see what papers have come out overnight. What's been really exciting is that this year, uh, for the first time, we're now over one million papers in this um, resource. Um, but there's other really interesting challenges for us to think about. As I said, this is bread and butter for many people in those disciplines, and yet, uh, it has been very graciously um, hosted at Cornell University Library uh, for some years and previous to that at Los Alamos National Laboratories. Um, but there are, um, while it's very valued, um, there are also questions about, you know, is this the right sort of thing for um, a university to be hosting? If they don't, who, who else would? And so uh, what we've been looking at is the sustainability of this as a model for the future. And I guess it's just saying to me, as a lot of universities are starting to have ask themselves very deep questions about what, what products and services they offer, not just you know, internally to their university, but also to the worldwide community, you know, what, um, what questions will be asked about you know, who manages these sorts of things into the future. We had some really interesting conversations. We're part of the Pacific Rim uh, Digital Library Alliance, and uh, which brings together people from um, particularly uh, the, you know, the west coast of, of the US, particularly places like Berkeley, UCLA, San Diego, and our friends at University of British Columbia. Uh, who encouraged us to join in the first place. And, and, and then on the other side of the rim, we have people like Peking University, National University of Singapore, and other Asian countries. And this group has been together for quite a long time, collecting research materials about um, particularly the Asian diaspora. And um, our colleagues at U uh, University of uh, California, Los Angeles, are actually doing a major project where they're collecting tweets. And in particular, they've been um, collecting them around Occupy Central because this will be really important information for researchers into the future. And they particularly pointed out problems where you're losing embedded links. Similarly, um, there's uh, a whole lot of broader questions about who should collect and preserve these tweets, whose job is it, and how also can we make sure that, that, that um, the workload's been shared around. Um, and so that's also led into some other discussions within the group about how we might um, harvest not just tweets but websites and work more closely with the Internet Archive. University of Southern California is a really interesting example and they've really um, come to their own in all their work as on Los Angeles as a place and in particular as a Pacific Rim metropolis. 
And we just think of it as movie studios and whatever, but it's a really fascinating home of modern architecture, suburbia, and all sorts of urban issues. And um, some really interesting things they're doing in the library there, they actually share a joint postdoctoral fellow between the history department and the, the library. They have, like we are doing, uh, getting more fellowships so that people come and use this information. Like we host the Rare Book Fair here, they host an annual LA Archives Bazaar which has over 1,500 attendees, where all these local institutions that are collecting information about the history of Los Angeles, including things like tunnels and, and really obscure things all come together. And they're also now involved with a TV series that's being made um, with KCET in, uh, on lost Los Angeles, and they're making pilots. The library is working with a film company. And um, interestingly also, an, ex an exhibition from University of Southern California is coming here to this building early next year. And so I'm looking forward to um, trying to arrange some seminars and things with our colleagues. And finally, um, uh, the University of Oregon that hosted our meeting um, has this uh, interesting portal which they call Do uh, Oregon Digital. And would you believe I checked in there to have a look at it as we were being presented on it and found Collins Street in one of their um, uh, rare uh, photographic collections um, at Eugene, Oregon. Uh, but again, this is a really interesting project and I won't go into any more detail now because we're running out of time, but it's a joint initiative between University of Oregon and Oregon Stra State University. But what they've done is they've also harvested and done a lot of um, linking with open, um, open linking um, uh, services and um, using standards to create new databases that can um, offer a lot more information about um, some of these uh, rich sources. And finally, I'm going to share with you uh, a closing comment, not from me, but from our very own Vice Chancellor. Um, at a meeting uh, just recently, um, someone asked him about um, the changes that have happened at Melbourne and also the divide between um, academics and, and professional staff. And one of the most interesting, quick as a flash, Glyn's response was, go and have a look at your library because you will see there people who are doing very different jobs than what they did um, in the past. And obviously he was pointing to this, this crossover between what librarians are doing and what researchers are doing and academics are doing. So I thought that was a, a good place to finish today. And I think I've given you quite a few examples of how some of those um, projects and activities that are happening within libraries, uh, both our own library and others uh, elsewhere, um, are evidence of that. And finally, I'm going to um, have a blatant advertisement um, before I sit down, which is that uh, if you've missed it, as I say here, this is the, very much the intersection between scholarship and culture, a very um, major aspect of what we're doing here in, in engagement uh, across the university. If you haven't seen it yet, the Rothschild Prayer Book is here. Mr. Kerry Stokes bought it for $17.5 million last year, and it's absolutely beautiful, and it's um, backed up by um, 60 other just amazing items from his personal collection. And you can see it right now at the Ian Potter Museum of Art. And I didn't know you were coming, Kelly, but <laughs> I put it in anyway. But um, good to have you here. Um, it, you've got till the 15th of November to pop over to the Potter um, sometime to see it. So that's all I've got to share with you today. Um, lots of information from a whole lot of areas, but I think all demonstrate the importance of libraries and librarians to the research process. Thank you.